Hello, my name is Amelia Winger Bearskin, and I'm a member of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma Deer Clan. We are Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois, people of the Longhouse, or the Six Nations. Um, and I'm here today to ask us all to do a land acknowledgement. So why introduce the practice of land acknowledgement? We offer recognition and respect. We counter the doctrine of discovery with the true story of the people who were already here. We create a broader public awareness of the history that has led to this moment. And we begin to repair the relationships with native communities and with the land. So in order to add your own land acknowledgement, please go into the chat window and enter your own land acknowledgement now. If you're unsure what land you are on, you can go to native-land.ca and find out. Today, I'm going to do a land acknowledgement of the Sacramento area, because that's where I am right now. And this specific one is from the Native American Health Center in Sacramento, where I got my COVID-19 vaccine. So I'm very thankful to them. The history of the Sacramento area and the people is rich in heritage, culture, and tradition. This area was, and still is, the tribal land of the Nisanan people. Sacramento was a gathering place for many local tribes who have lived throughout the Central Valley and the foothills for generations and were the original stewards of this land. We would like to acknowledge the southern Maidu people to the north and the valley and the plains Miwok, Miwok people to the south of the American River. And we would also like to honor the Patwin Wintern peoples of the west of the Sacramento River. We acknowledge that we are standing on the tribal lands of Sacramento's indigenous people. Thank you. I got into coding because I wanted to do things that I couldn't do by myself. And m being able to collaborate with machines meant that I could do things that I do poorly faster, and then I could do things that machines do poorly uh, better. <laughs> The first place I started performing was with my mom, who was a storyteller from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I would play the Iroquois rattle and drum while she told stories. I then became a classically trained opera singer. I started composing and directing and making more and more emerging technology mixed with live performance and opera, and kind of ended up in museums. Nowadays, I use a lot of different media, AR and VR or interactive media to tell stories, co-creating with other types of non-human systems. As an artist or as an activist, I look at the way that the Iroquois Confederacy was built. We said that anything that I'm doing now is the result of seven generations behind me. Anything I do will have a lasting impact on the seven generations ahead of me. We use stories as a way of taking values and ethics and putting them into the core of innovation. I started looking at the media landscape we have now. How do I take information and encode it for future generations? A lot of my work is really about creating an ethical framework for software development and design and articulation of values and ethics within technologies with the understanding that we need to future-proof these. There's a notion that the technology we've created now has outrun us. No one knows how to regulate it. We accidentally opened this Pandora's box and we can't get it all back inside. But actually, we can choose to use technology to build a more just world, a more equitable world. We can demand that. We can say that we want algorithms that are human-centered, that are for our environment, that are pro-democracy. We can articulate the values we want to see in technology and communicate those to seven generations in the future. What do we want to achieve with the culture and social network that we're creating? I began my work in virtual reality um, very, like, in the late 90s um, in a lot of these kind of simulatory environments and working with museums. We had sort of crazy types of headsets, but... Um, I made a virtual reality piece uh, called Your Hands or Feet, and I'll show you a little bit about that. There is that really crazy sound effect when the giant's leg gets shaved. That's this really strange sponge that I bought that's the worst sponge ever. Like, it's so bad at scrubbing dishes. And we sat there and we were listening to it and we are like, this is, this is the sound of shaving a giant's leg. This is perfect.
You know, Sarah was the first person I had met as an artist who was just working in VR in a more playful way. We just started brainstorming and thinking of moments when you virtually give someone a piece of your life, like in, in daily life. If I'm talking to Sarah and I'm trying to explain to her how I felt that morning or what I was thinking about the future, very frequently we prototype those kinds of experiences with sayings or with metaphors. So I can say like, I walked into that room and my stomach just dropped, or it was so like loud that I felt like my ears were bleeding. Your Hands or Feet is a VR experience. It's an interactive exploration of new metaphors. The experience starts off where you're in kind of this surreal looking kitchen and you have in front of you a half dozen carton of eggs and inside of each egg is contained an experience that has some kind of psychologically complex action to it that we hope acts as something that you think back on and you're like, wow, this is such a strange feeling. It kind of reminds me of, for instance, like that time that I felt like my hands were feet. I don't know. I feel like my mind is a confusing machine. What we're really doing here is we're creating these metaphors that like maybe don't exist, but might apply in a situation as like the perfect way to describe this thing. In the beginning, I started with a basic treatment. So I created a lot of 3D assets to just sort of mock up this world, sort of the look and feel. And we came up with this idea of having it be like a half dozen experiences from, you know, a half egg carton and how we would move from each each space. Landing on the visuals for any project is an interesting process. You know, you have to make something that feels true to something that you like, but it also has to be something true to what the other person likes. Sarah said she had this amazing friend, Neve Bavarsky in LA, who was a uh, illustrator. We reached out to Neve and, you know, showed him all of the reference imagery, showed him our very tight color palette of what we were trying to go for. And we were like, can you do the Neve version of your hands or feet universe? And then from there, um, we were like, how are we gonna put this thing together? Because translating from 2D into 3D seems easy, but to keep the same visual style is not always so straightforward. It made a lot of sense like for us to approach it with a style that's inviting and not like, depressing or scary, but just a little bit scary, maybe. It's really helpful to like take those two concepts and then give it to one person that can execute that so that it stays really consistent. So we were like, let's try this tool, Medium, which is a 3D um, VR sculpting tool. And so we felt like, oh, this is perfect that we found this, this way to find like a slice of what we were interested in a way that we can produce it in a really organic and fun way. And that's kind of how we landed on the visual style that we're at right now. A lot of our music is going to be generative. So generative music is when you're really designing those whys, therefores, and ifs. You know, normally you listen to a song and it's got the beginning and the middle of the end and there's like nothing you can do about it. But in an interactive song, there's ways that you can alter parts of it so that way you're sort of participating with the music. Every object that you pick up is like contains an audio track. Depending on which objects you interact with, you're really flushing out what the soundscape of that environment is. Me and Sarah are doing all this work to create a really fun playground. We might have kind of serious concepts about the emotional resonance behind each of the interactions, which we have very long and engaged conversations about, like even the, the physicality of grabbing that object, to, that action has to be connected. So we want each of the interactions to also be analogous to a place in time that you might have had that feeling. When I look at it from an outside perspective, I'm like, a lot of these things have to do with frustration, but a lot of them also have to do with joy and feeling joy while doing something frustrating. And so I want to give people a moment where they can interact with that quality of VR, where they can say, this is an extension of my brain and my experience within the world. This isn't the real world. This is the computational amalgamation of human understanding in this world. And I want to give people an opportunity to interact with that and interface with that. When we explain it to people, they just get it and they're excited about it, even though it's like, Oh, it's like an experience where your hands are feet because don't you ever just feel like a weird feeling and you don't know how to describe it and it's like something you've never felt before? Well, isn't VR the perfect way to kind of explore that? And people are like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so that's been pretty surprising also. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello, I'm so excited to be a part of Games for Change 2021. My name is Amelia Wingerbearskin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to speak today about Wampum.codes, which is both a podcast and an ethical framework for software development. I've created virtual reality games and experiences, worked with artificial intelligence to create creative applications of machine learning technologies for interactive and gaming experiences. And I'm excited to, ex to share my experience with each of you today. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd like to read you a little statement that I wrote about that. If history was written by the victors, then the future will be written by the vectors. Artificial intelligence will radically change our world, our lives, our planet, and it remains to be seen if it will be a positive or a negative. If it's said that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it, I would add that those who ignore data have underfitted models. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were looking for a new model to serve as a basis for the United States government, they were very impressed by the Iroquois Confederacy. We call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse. We're made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Thomas Jefferson spent over a year with us in upstate New York in one of our largest cities. When Jefferson and Franklin and the other founding fathers drafted the U.S. Constitution, they cherry-picked the best parts that were most beneficial to their own political purposes, the bits that seemed to align the best with their Enlightenment-era ideology, representation, voting, checks and balances, etc. But they left out the social and cultural networks that sustained these practices in the actual Iroquois Confederacy. Well, what did they leave out? In the Iroquois Constitution, women... Clan mothers from each tribe were the only ones who could vote for the representative who was always a man, a chief. Actually, the word for clan mother and chief is the same word. There was a balance of power. Only men could serve and only women could vote. Their economy was driven through complex agricultural arrangements. Everyone in the community participated in planting and harvesting. It was not an economy of slavery-dependent plantation agriculture. This is an example of colonial mindset. I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. I take it and I take what will benefit my own paradigm, but I'm unconcerned with the effect it will have being taken out of context and the effect it'll have on the people I take it from. This is like trying to run a program without checking its dependencies. What if it turns out that the Confederate democracy or lasting peace and prosperity is dependent upon a balance of power along gender lines? or upon a different economic model than the one practiced by European settlers in North America? Or what if it imagines a system of agriculture where the environment is protected and maintains sus sustainable practices? We all have colonial mindset, just because our culture has colonial mindset. But here's the thing, we're not colonial subjects, and we don't have to live under a colonial empire anymore. In data science, we talk about models suffering from either overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is when a model exhibits a low degree of bias, but a high degree of variance. In other words, it accepts a lot of differences within the data, but it doesn't have very much predictive power. Underfitting is the inverse of this, high bias, low variance. This is what happens when you make a generalization without enough data, or when the data is not diverse enough to represent the real world. The big problem with colonial mindset is one of underfitting, extracting idea without the context that made that idea work in the first place. I'm here to say, don't colonize our future. Our plans for the future need to include more data from diverse cultures and societies, and not only those ideas that flatter what we already think. For instance, let's say you want to lay the groundwork for a society run on the blockchain. What does that look like? How does that work? What are the consequences? If we don't have significant data, we might just have to wing it. But we actually have thousands of years of data about decentralized economies. The use of wampum, um, among the Iroquois functioned as a decentralized distributed ledger of contracts, and it helped us govern, govern our society for centuries. Wampum is an example of what I've termed antecedent technology, and there are many more cases like this. In South America, the Inca had a Turing complete system of knot tying called Kipu, which predated modern computing by hundreds of years. When we want to use powerful new technologies such as AI or blockchain, and we want as much data as we can to help us imagine positive change in the world, we do not need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. I want people to know that indigenous people had technologies that have solved complex issues. 
I want us to use their data to help us dream our future, and I want us to believe that just because we have had 500 years of slavery, worker exploitation, poverty, and gender imbalance, we have had thousands of years of peace, prosperity, and equality right here in the country where I'm standing right now.